I would like to think with you for a couple of minutes about a, um, a way of thinking about the transmission of the whole Bible that actually provides us with some sort of a larger context to think about it. So when you trace a theme throughout scripture, that's normally called biblical theology. So very briefly, for the coming minutes, we are going to trace the theme of the transmission of the Bible as it is told by scripture itself. So that's the sort of thing we're going to do. Uh, because we want to answer the question, um, why did God allow textual variants to happen? Does the Bible give us any sort of help with this question? Okay, the first thing is uh, God does not tell us why. There is no immediate section in scripture that tells us, oh yes, and in the future there will be textual variants and some people will earn a living out of that. Nothing like that. Um, but of course, this question can turn very quickly into an accusation. I mean, why, if, if the Bible is really inspired, why does God allow this to happen? If God inspired the Bible so that people would have his very words, why did God uh, allow variants to happen, which would, to a certain degree, perhaps obscure his very words, can become an accusation very quickly. Why questions can be asked with wrong intention? And there are why questions that are actually wrong. And there are why questions in scripture that when the motivation is wrong, they, um, they are basically uh, slammed down. For example, in, in Romans 9, where Paul exclaims, I mean, who are you, O man, no, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Here we have a why question, and Paul basically says, yeah, sorry, if you ask it in such a way, you are accusing the creator itself. So be always aware with why question. They may go back to an accusation type of spirit, and perhaps you don't need to deal with it as serious as you would otherwise do. But when the question is genuine, of course, we should do what we always do and trace what God has done over the ages and see if it gives us a certain context for an answer. Now, let's start for a moment with counting our blessings. I mean, it's always a good thing to do, but, but let's, when we think about the text of Scripture, let's count our blessings. The first thing is, the message of Scripture and the message of the Gospel has not been lost. No, the gospel has been preserved. And secondly, if we take every chapter of scripture in turn, the message of that chapter has been preserved. Okay, there may be one or two difficulties here. One of them may be the ending of Mark, where there might be a difficulty. And the other one in the New Testament is the story of the woman caught in adultery. There may be one or two questions, but in general, a message of every chapter has been preserved. Thirdly, that is also true for almost every paragraph and every sentence within these paragraphs, that we know very well what the author is trying to say, what the text is saying to us. Uh, you can zoom in quite a bit in sort of in the picture, and still get sufficient details. But of course, the further you zo zoom in, sometimes the image gets more grainier. And at a certain time, you cannot zoom further in because the resolution of the image doesn't allow it. It's the same with, with Google Earth type of images. No? Uh, when you, you zo zoom out, sort of, you know exactly the lay of the land, where the cities are, where the roads are, etc. But sometimes, no, the resolution of the image prevents you from zooming in too much. Does that disqualify the truthfulness of the overall picture you have? 
No, of course not. The overall picture is there. It is just the sort of the details where you uh, get some questions unanswered. But of course, with counting all our blessings, God has put limits to our knowledge. And it's limits to our knowledge, not his. In that case, we do not know everything. We have an abundance of material, we have lots to study, but there are boundaries to our knowledge of the transmission of the text. Just as uh, there are boundaries to our knowledge when it comes to the history of, for example, Abraham's background or Melchizedek in the Old Testament, just as there are boundaries to our understanding of Greek and Hebrew grammar. There are boundaries to all sorts of things we know about the text. Now, to expect that the transmission of Scripture would be the sole area of knowledge of God's work on earth, where there would not be any boundary, is in fact a sort of out-of-sorts expectation. That is not how things work. So it's unreasonable to demand it just for this area then. Let's start with the story of the preservation of Scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, so there are boundaries, but let's sort of revel in the things we, we can learn. Um, how did the Bible come to us? Um, well, the first thing is that in the Old Testament, we learn that the Levites who are carrying the ark are made responsible for preserving the Bible. That's an interest. How did the Old Testament start? Or let's start with the Old Covenant. How was, what was the start of the Old Covenant? Spectacular. Uh, what happened at the very beginning? Well, God speaks from Mount Sinai to Moses and to the people. And then God starts the Old Covenant, or the Covenant, by inscribing with his own finger some tablets of stone. I mean, as a sort of textual scholar, I love this sort of beginning of the covenant. It starts with oh, God writing with his finger on tablets of stone. I mean, and I would like to know what sort of script that was. I would like to know sort of well, how, what characters. Was it an alphabetic script or not? Was it sort of Egyptian-based or was it more cuneiform? Type? There are all sorts of questions I have, but God wrote with his own finger, the words of the covenant. And when Moses uh, smashed the first uh, version to pieces, God rewrote with his own finger there. Um, and these tablets of stone end up in the ark. Now, then we get sort of 40 years later with, uh, when Moses sort of uh, narrates the whole book of Deuteronomy to the people. We get this in Deuteronomy 32. When Moses had finished writing the words of the uh, law to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. I'm not going to sort of think about the witness against you at the moment, but what I'm interested in is where is the master copy of this book kept? Next to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant that contained the original tablets of stone written by God himself. Here we have Moses' version, Moses' writing, and his book of the law, the book of the law, is kept next to the Ark. He had to entrust it to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant. This is the beginning of textual preservation in the Old Testament. A mechanism is set in place where certain people are made res responsible for the preservation of Scripture. And we find confirmation of this a little bit earlier in the book, where we get an announcement for the coming king. Now, uh, God knew that uh, Israel would appoint a king, and God says about the, uh, him in Deuteronomy 17, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the Levitical priests. Isn't that beautiful? Here the king, 
no, the highest authority, highest legal authority in, in the country, is placed under the jurisdiction of God's law. So the king has humbly to make his own copy of it. And from, from, what, has, uh, from what manuscript does he have to copy? Well, he has to make his copy from the one that belongs to the Levitical priests. So the king gets the privilege to copy for himself um, the text there. And he has to be kept it all the time. So again, the master copy is kept with the temple. Um, but then, of course, we get King Josiah, where knowledge of scripture has almost completely vanished. Um, but what happens when they start clearing out the temple? While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered, said to Shavan the secretary, I have found the book of the law. Great, good news. Where did you find it? Of course, where it should be kept in the first place, in the house of the Lord. So the master copy, if it was the master copy here, survived in the house of God. The temple here, not the tabernacle any longer, but the temple is the place where the authoritative uh, word of God is kept. And that seems to have been the case in two New Testament times, despite the fact that the temple was destroyed a couple of times and looted a couple of times, which has, of course, an effect on, on the whole thing. Um, it's interesting what Jesus says in Matthew 23. You know? He says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do, and observe whatever they tell you. That's quite a statement, no? Jesus, of course, doesn't say that uh, you need to copy them in their behavior, because he calls them hypocrites. But still, Jesus acknowledges that the temple in his days, the scribes and the Pharisees, had a special God-given responsibility when it comes to preserving and teaching the law. Jesus is not sort of the rampant revolutionary or in that sense. He acknowledges that what God has established be, um, uh, remained true. But then, of course, we get the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So interestingly located close to the beginning of the New Testament. Um, and with that, the central source of textual authority is lost. And the Talmud reflects actually back on the, on the copies of scripture that were kept in the temple and were compared to one another. Um, so the Talmud is very much aware that the temple was, at least had been, the central authority. And of course, if you went to Jerusalem from abroad and you were on your way back, I mean, say to Ethiopia, for example, as in Acts 8, it is not strange that you bought your copy of scripture in Jerusalem and was reading it on the way home, because that is how the temple functioned. And the medieval Masoretic manuscripts we have now seem to reflect that temple text. So we get all sorts of marginal notes that seem to reflect the things that were there in the scrolls as they were kept up to the first century in the temple. So in that sense, the textual transmission of the Old Testament is fairly clear. Now we get to the new set situation in the New Testament. Now, we saw the Old Covenant had an impressive scribal beginning with God himself writing the tablets of stone. How is the new covenant going to begin? And of course, in the context of the reliability of God's word, it's, it's a very important question. Well, let's first see how the new covenant was announced in the Old Testament. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant is introduced here in terms of a change in scribal culture. As the old covenant 
started with God writing on tablets of stone with his own finger. The new covenant starts with God writing his law on the very hearts of people. And that is what makes the old covenant better than the, or the what makes the new covenant better than the old covenant. Um, we, we would have loved, perhaps, to have the sort of New te uh, Testament written on tablets of stone we could all call seer. Actually, we're better off now. Now it is God, through his Holy Spirit, who were, writes his laws, his word, in our hearts. And this is a very small step to what uh, Scripture says in John 14, where Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, or the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And this is in the context where the Father and the Son promise to dwell in the heart of the believers by sending the Holy Spirit in us. The New Testament is fundamentally different there, and it is better. So the emphasis of the apostles initially is on teaching. The writing came later, and that is in line with the spirit of the new covenant. But they started to write letters. The first letters that seems to be written, we find in Acts 15, where at the Council of Jerusalem, the, the apostles write a letter. And I think scribal culture within the church started right there. Um, we get um, references to, to letters in uh, 2 Peter 3, where the reference to Paul's letters. Um, these letters are important, but it is all without a central authority. The temple has no longer, longer that function. The church grew quickly, there was no central th temple, and that is how the church was designed to be. I mean, the church was, was the new temple. It was not supposed to gather around a physical temple. And that absence of an earthly central authority, despite the efforts by many denominations you know, to make something the, the central authority, whether it be Rome or Moscow or Salt Lake City or whatever, it is outside what the New Testament has uh, destined the church to be. The church is the temple. And that had consequences for how the transmission of the new covenant would take place from the day-to-day -day basis. No longer centralized. There would be no longer a guardian to, uh, who could say, okay, you're doing that wrong, you're doing wrong. I have the master copy here, what's happening there? That central authority would not exist in the terms of the new covenant. So. At this point in salvation history, we are in a strange paradox. On the one hand, we have the written word of God, both the Hebrew Old Testament and the teachings of the apostles about Jesus. And this written word of God is the guide for the church. But rather uniquely in this dispensation, if I may use the word, there is also the Holy Spirit who takes what is imperfect and makes that what is imperfect a monument of God's victory over all that is imperfect. And that is the beauty of the current dispensation. And it is actually the theological context of why the transmission of the new covenant is strange, so unlike the words of the old covenant. Why did God not do? Well, I can think of a thousand reasons why God did not sort of uh, no, uh, enforce a flawless transmission. He could have done, but he didn't do. And all of my thousand reasons may be wrong because God is so much bigger. He, he may have reasons I haven't thought of, which is quite likely. But God, as the God of history, is good. He is, by definition, good. And that is why I trust that the current situation is the situation he has destined for us to be in. 
At the end of a Revelation, we get these words. These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Since these words are important, it is in all our interest to know exactly as possible what those very words are. Because we, the more precise we know the words, the more precise we have access to the very words by which the Holy Spirit expressed the mind of God himself. And since the Holy Spirit takes what is imperfect and perfects it in God's glorious providence, I have absolute confidence that just as there has been not a single church split about a textual variant, so God will use his imper our um, imperfect understanding of his word to fulfill all he has destined for us. Thank you very much.